Welcome to the 288th of the COVID Calls. This is a daily discussion of the COVID-19 pandemic with a diverse collection of disaster experts. My name is Scott Gabriel Knowles. I'm a historian of disasters at the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. I'm coming to you live from Daejeon, South Korea. Today, I welcome Professor Bin Su to discuss COVID-19 and the legacy of the Sichuan earthquake in China, alongside cultures of mourning around the world today. Just a reminder, you can usually catch COVID Calls live on weekdays at 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Just go to the COVID Calls YouTube channel to watch. You can also hear COVID Calls anytime recorded as podcasts on Spotify, iTunes, Podbean, or anywhere you get podcasts. You can keep up with COVID Calls via Twitter using the handle at US of Disaster or at COVID Calls. Please help spread the word and send suggestions for future guests and future topics, and please feel free to suggest yourself as a future guest. As of today, June 7th, 2021, there are 3,730,610 deaths globally from COVID-19, according to the Johns Hopkins University Coronavirus Resource Center. 597,631 of those deaths are in the United States. China reports 5,106 deaths from COVID-19. Those statistics are according to the World Health Organization, and the World Health Organization reports that China has to date distributed 634,131,055 vaccine doses. As a way to bring some humanity to the numbers, I've been reading a life story or a story of advocacy for those impacted by the pandemic in some way, and I'd like to continue that now. The headline is Vera Sathadar, cultural figure who fought India's caste system, dies at 62. This is written by Mujib Mashal and Hari Kumar and appeared May 5th, 2021 in the New York Times. Dateline, New Delhi. Vera Sathadar played the role of a protest singer enmeshed in India's frustrating legal system in court, a 2014 movie that won accolades in India and around the world. Yet Mr. Sathadar, a lifelong activist against injustice with little screen experience, remained uncomfortable describing himself as an actor. Acting, he said, was just another tool in the toolbox of protest, along with organizing, pamphleteering, editing, writing poetry, and singing. Song and dance was a weapon of our fight, he once said. It still is. Mr. Sathadar died of complications of COVID-19 on April 13th at a hospital in Nagpur, in the state of Maharashtra, his son Ravan said. He was 62. Mr. Sathadar agitated against the deeply rooted caste system in India, under which those at the bottom, his fellow Dalits or untouchables, are systematically abused. A high school dropout, he wrote books and articles, edited magazines and organized street performances. For a brief time, he ran a book stall. He was the head of the Maharashtra chapter of the Confederation of Human Rights Organizations. He was a living library, his friend Nihal Singh Rathod said, on political science, on social science. Vira Sathadar was born on June 7, 1958, in the village of Parsodi near Nagpur to Ralph and Gangabai Sathadar. His father, a farmer, was a staunch supporter of B.R. Ambedkar, one of India's most influential thinkers and political figures. Mr. Ambedkar, himself a Dalit, was part of the Indian independence movement and played a central role in drafting the constitution for the future republic. He was also a tireless opponent of the caste system, and Mr. Sathadar often cited his influence in setting him on the road to activism. Mr. Sathadar said his father wanted him to be a scholar, but he was a distracted student, and he left school after 10th grade to work at a cotton thread mill. Mr. Sathadar's activism began when he was a union organizer at the mill. He found himself working with the radical Maoist movement called the Naxalites, in the 1990s. He went underground for a time but became disillusioned, his friend Pradeep Maitra, the Nagpur correspondent for the Hindustan Times, said in an interview. He got disappointed with the movement because of their emphasis on classless society and ignoring the Ambedkar notion of casteless society. Along with his son, Mr. Sathadar, who lived in Nagpur, survived by his wife, Pushpa Viplav Sathadar, as well as three brothers and a sister. Mr. Sathadar came to broader attention after court, the program, 
An examination of the injustices India's labyrinthine legal system perpetuates against the marginalized. The director, Chaitanya Tamhan, was looking for a cast of largely unprofessional actors. For months, his team held casting calls across several states trying to recruit from theater groups and street performers. He was having trouble casting the lead role, Narayan Kambal, a Dalit protest singer and poet who's accused of performing songs that induce a Mumbai sewer worker to commit suicide. Then Mr. Tom Han discovered Mr. Sathadar through an activist group. He cast him just before shooting started. I thought they were taking me in the film because they couldn't find a good actor or they didn't have enough budget, Mr. Sathadar said in a video interview. He said he was struck by how much his character, Narayan, resembled him. He has worked at a factory. I have worked in a factory, Mr. Sathadar said. He writes articles. I also write articles. He is an editor. I'm also an editor. He works at a union. I also work at a union. He sings songs. I sing songs. He goes to jail. I've also been to jail many times. His house is raided. My house is also raided. What he is showing is my life, Mr. Sathadar said. What surprised me was that he wrote all of this without having met me. Okay, I'd like to turn to my conversation today, and let me introduce my guest to you. Binsu is an associate professor of sociology at Emory University. His research interests lie at the intersection of politics and culture, including collective memory, civil society, cultural sociology, and social theory. He's the author of The Politics of Compassion, the Sichuan Earthquake and Civic Engagement in China, which appeared with Stanford Press in 2017 and which won the 2018 Best Book Prize for Culture and Honorable Mention for Asia from the American Sociological Association. He's also the author of Chairman Mao's Children, Generation and the Politics of Memory in China, forthcoming with Cambridge Press. His articles have appeared in leading sociological and China studies journals. He's working on his third book as well, The Culture of Democracy, a Sociological Approach to Civil Society. And he has two ongoing projects related to mourning, commemorations, and symbolic politics in the COVID-19 crisis. Ben Su, thank you so much for making time to join me on COVID Calls today. Thank you very much. I'd like to start the way I generally do, just to find out where you're calling from and what the pandemic situation is looking like there at this point. I'm calling from my home office in Atlanta, Georgia, in the United States. So the general situation in the United States, uh, you and the audience probably have known that is getting better uh, because of the uh, uh, vaccination campaign actually works and the cases are lower, getting lower and lower. And at least half of the adult population had already got vaccinated, fully vaccinated. Uh, so my family and I got fully vaccinated. We had a brief vacation a few weeks ago. Um, so that was a sigh of a relief. I'm glad you're able to take a vacation. Is that the first time that you've done something like that in these 15 yes. months? Yes. So the last time uh, we were away from Atlanta was to send my daughter to, to, to a college. That was a very quick trip. And everybody was like, uh, you know, taking on the you know, refugee trip instead of a vacation. But this time it's actual vacation. In restaurants, uh, certainly masks are on, but people are got more relieved. And, and that, that's basically the situation here. Did it feel somehow disorienting to be re-entering those, those things that you wouldn't have thought much about a year and a half ago? Yeah, it's like a, when you are breathing air, you never thought about it. But when you're losing it, you're suffocating. I wonder if you wouldn't mind, as you just think back over these past, past 15, 16 months, what's your strongest impression of that time? Yeah, I think the strongest impression of the past 15 to 16 months is now a massive disaster can really go very, very global. Um, being global in different senses at different layers, uh, which means, of course, at the macro level, you see the cases as spreading across uh, countries' borders, and, but also at the individual levels, particularly like the, this global crisis is affecting people like me, who uh, grew up in one country but migrating to uh, another country and working in another country. So the original plan for last year was we 
went back for it, went back to China for a long vacation and then to Europe and Japan and probably and to celebrate my daughter's graduation from high school and turn into college and see her grandparents and these family visits. Mm -hmm. But all of a sudden, everything is gone. So it's basically the two countries are isolated from each other and people are not able to get in touch with each other and uh, maybe just online contact, but that actually doesn't substitute the in-person um, interactions. And also many things are global and people, all, almost all countries are affected. And then the um, people are comparing to each other, right? <laughs> the which country mm -hmm. uh, does better than others, and uh, many issues are transnational and debates, and everything is in a chaotic situation. But this chaos is a very global chaos. In previous disasters, such as you know the um, the uh, tsunami in two thousand four, and also uh, the uh, three eleven in Japan and, and Sichuan earthquake in China, we talked about global disaster, but we never had such a strong sense of being global as this deeper level that affecting everybody's lives, uh, as long as your life is connected to outside world. Um, in today's world, it's hard to find anyone who is not really connecting to, to, the, to the outside world. So that's my biggest thing impression. And, and also, I think I, I had a very strong sense of um, brief relief in November <laughs> last mm. year, uh, not only because of the presidential election in the United States, um, everybody was you know talking about it, but also about the vaccination, um, uh, vaccine development success at the time when Pfizer and Moderna announced that their development was a great success and, and it's very, very effective. So that was that was a month that um, I almost like um, didn't do any research and watching TV and, and reading things online. I, I think you're describing the experience of many people in the month of November, not only in the US, but around the world. You still That's have right. family in China? Hmm. Yeah. I'm sorry, what? You still have family in China? Yes, my parents are living in China and, and my parents-in-laws are in China as well. So um, regularly, we go back to China every year or every two years. But the plan now is completely canceled. And also, a uncertain thing is that we don't know when I can get back to China because of the policies and the air ticket prices are uh, higher and, and things like that enormously complicated and those policies are changing all the time and I can say the view from South Korea where I am is that even within East Asia there's a wide variety of policies involving quarantine probably we're moving into a vaccination passport period where people could could move from place to place but in China the vaccinations have proceeded very rapidly here in South Korea very slowly so it's mm -hmm. it's uneven even in this part of the world well, thank you for, for sharing those ideas. I, I want to turn to, we have a lot to discuss today. I want to start um, with some of your previous work and particularly your award-winning book, The Politics of Compassion, the Sichuan Earthquake and Civic Engagement in China. Um, I just want to say at the outset, it's an honor to talk to you about this book. It's a, it's a phenomenal achievement. And I'm really, I'm, um, I'm sorry for the concept, you know, the sort of context, we have to talk about this, this book in the context of COVID um, because of, the misery shared worldwide, but I do think that your book is a points away to methods that all researchers need to be taking on board right now um, to try to understand what disasters mean and what they do. So, having said that, I just want to say um, thank you for writing the book because I think it's great. And maybe you could start out by giving us some of the context of that of that earthquake. Why why was it so important? Sure, um, the earthquake happened in two thousand eight in May. Uh, May 12th. Um, so it was one of the biggest disasters in the history of People's Republic of China. The casualties are very heavy and 87,000 people died in the earthquake. And um, it affected the whole Sichuan province and other adjacent provinces in China, in the southwest part of China. Um, so um, the disaster was very significant, not only because of it, the casualties and devastations um, but also because of its political and cultural context 
back then. So it was the year of 2008. Um, that was an Olympic year. So the Chinese government uh, is trying everything to make the Olympic a kind of a show to the world about the, a, an image of a rise, rising of chi China and also um, its friendliness to the outside world. But before the earthquake, two months before the earthquake, there was a riot and a protest and a riot um, in Tibetan areas in, in China. And then the uh, the protest was uh, cracked down upon by the Chinese government in a very brutal way, which provoked controversies and angers and also boycotts of the Olympics uh, in many places in the world. So that was kind of a PR crisis for the United, for the for the Chinese government. And someone later after the earthquake said that the earthquake actually saved the Olympics, which meant that the earthquake with its casualties and also compassion toward the victims gave the Chinese government an opportunity to show its sympathy and also to show off its uh, quick response. And the Chinese government actually seized the opportunity and responded to the earthquake in a quite satisfactory way. Um, very quick and also mobilized all the resources from all over the country. And the uh, the premier Wen Jiabao flew to the earthquake site only two hours after the earthquake, and showed compa uh, compassion and also shed tears and uh, stuff like that. So it was a quite uh, emotional moment for the whole country. Um, so um, the initial response has another interesting aspect: is that the Chinese government, being an authoritarian regime, uh, was surprisingly quite open to the outside world open to the media. So CNN, BBC were able, and NPR as well, uh, were able to enter some of the most devastated uh, sites to report. Um, and also the domestic journalists uh, converged in on the sites and also open to the volunteers from all over the country, even all over the world. Um, so millions of volunteers went to Sichuan to offer help. That was actually the topic of my book is to look at how volunteers uh, did their work there and how they interpret their uh, the meaning of their work and uh, what kind of difficulties and dilemmas they encounter in Sichuan and how do they deal with the deal with the, these uh, dilemmas. Um, so this is a topic about civil society of, of the earthquake. But that was a very brief moment of openness. In June, only one month after the earthquake, things happened. And people begin to question about some of the issues, such as school collapse issues. Many, many schools collapsed. Uh, five, uh, at least 5,000 students died in their own schools, and pe people began to ask questions about why. And then um, it was a moment of constraining instead of openness that the Chinese government decided to, you know, um, uh, to block the access of the to, to the earthquake area uh, for um, the journalists and, and the volunteers to some extent, and also crack down upon uh, some of the volunteers trying to find out why. So that was the the end of the openness, and people had a very high hope for the civil society in the wake of the earthquake, uh, which probably reminded some people. Um, of the you know Kobe earthquake in, in, in Japan, which was uh, regarded as the birth year of a civil society in Japan, and the same phrase, the birth year of a civil society, was used in China in the wake of the Sichuan earthquake. But that high hope didn't become reality. Um, people began to find out the civil society actually was facing up to the the more constraining environment than before after a very brief moment, maybe a year of development and later find out programs got canceled and volunteers were driven out and uh, activists were jailed and the things like that. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was a moment of sadness, sorrow and hope and enthusiasm and later disappointment uh, in the, that, that was basically the story of Tucson's Tucson Ace Parents Break. Did you find your way into this project because you were trying to document this civil society and its many different permutations within China at that time period? Or did you, it would, the Sichuan earthquake itself was 
uh, what drew you into the topic? I mean, how did you find your way into it? Because you use the earthquake itself. I mean, you're very faithful in in recording the history of the earthquake and, and quite ingenious in the way that you carry out that methodology. But you're also examining the ways that that disaster sheds light on what I think many people outside of China have sort of been saying, well, democracy is certainly coming. Let's let's find the very many different ways that democracy is emerging in China through these civil society means. And that discourse sort of goes on kind of all the time outside of China. So I'm wondering like how you found your way into into this examination of civil society by way of the earthquake. Well, it, it, the, the way I got into this topic is completely accidental. <laughs> I started my dissertation uh, topic with another one, which already passed the defense of my dissertation proposal. And suddenly the earthquake actually happened. So I decided to switch my topic, which actually <laughs> was kind of a academic suicide at this stage of, uh, of dissertation. But um, the reason I, I changed topic is that uh, in the summer of 2008, right after the earthquake, well, two months after the earthquake, I went to Sichuan as a volunteer. So I experienced all the volunteers experience, uh, all my interviewees experience in the wake of the earthquake. I was one of them. I was one of the millions of the volunteers. So I began to think about uh, many issues I never thought about before, because before I entered Sichuan as a volunteer, I thought volunteering, well, it's just to help people, right? It's a, it's a good thing to be nice. And, and sometimes uh, you have some self-congratulations <laughs> of yourself and that, you know, you go to the disaster zone, which is dangerous, and then you feel good about yourself and that kind of a thing. But after I went there, um, I find out the, the things are more complicated. For example, if you're teaching in a tent school in summer, which is very common practice of an outside volunteer, but not very far away from your tent school, there is a school already collapsed. That's the, your students' previous school and collapsed. And then your students and parents told you that there are more than 100 students die in that school. And they will tell you that the construction of the school was very shoddy. And they witnessed all the problems, but they didn't really dare to talk about it. Or when they talked about it and the government um, tell them to shut up. And you begin to think about what am I doing here? I'm helping the kids, of course. But what about the cause of all their suffering and the sorrow? And particularly when parents told you um, the stories about their kids who died and you felt like you feel really guilty and, and not helping them um, at a more deeper level. And you certainly, you know, um, volunteer for several days and then you left and without any, you know, leaving any impacts on their life. And you, you can, you know, share your uh, pictures on social media. Everybody was praising you and you feel good about yourself. But does that actually solve the problem? and what's the political impacts of the individual acts. So that was the initial, initial thoughts behind this project. So the key of this project um, is, a big, uh, is a big picture, but also is a big, is an individual's moral dilemma and choice in the bigger picture of the political context. So to, and, and also back then I didn't know how to talk about it because it didn't really fit into many of the mainstream paradigms in sociology. So I struggled for a long time and finally find my voice in the book, which is the something I really want to address. That is, you know, volunteers went to Sichuan and they understand their meanings and the meanings of their work in various ways. Some of the meanings are moral and also political, and they have dilemmas in, um, in those uh, places and at the very critical moments of their life. And their uh, understanding of the meanings and also the way they help people or not helping people have implications for Chinese civil society. So it, it's, it's a way to think about the connection between individuals and the broader political and the cultural context. So that's, that's how I you know, um, entered this project. Well, thank you for sharing that description of being there as well. And I appreciated what you're saying, that this was a moment of change in your dissertation project. And for graduate students listening, um, uh, you can do that. 
Um, and sometimes it, 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 history compels you, the moment compels you to do that. I want to read a, a sentence from the, from the book that just really captures um, my attention. And it, you write, the sheer number of volunteers in Sichuan, millions, and many not organized by the state, made the civic engagement in the rescue and recovery the largest collective action since the Tiananmen incident in 1989. There's a lot there in that sentence. On, on the one hand, it forces us to think about um, the kind of a classic concept in disaster sociology, convergence mm -hmm. behavior. Yep. But we never think of convergence, well, at least I don't usually think of convergence at that scale. Mm -hmm. But the other is that, and I wonder if you saw yourself in this way, apparently Chinese government officials saw this gathering of people as um, potentially quite dangerous to the political order of the regime. And I don't think we generally think of convergence in that way either. Mm -hmm. Yeah, convergence behavior is a classical term, you know, uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with this few, the classical terms uh, to describe that people and information converged uh, in the disaster site. And usually it's described in a political, uh, a political way, but in the context of China, Sheer number is a political thing. Even the purpose of a gathering is apolitical. If the number is big and the state will at least keep an eye on, if the number is huge, it is a political issue, regardless of their purposes. Um, and, and I compare this to the Tiananmen incident. We just passed a few days of the Tiananmen incident um, anniversary because it was the largest collective action since Tiananmen because millions of people, even bigger than the Tiananmen incident. Um, but it's for a different purpose. It's, it's, it looks like an apolitical purpose to help people to volunteer, which is a good thing, which actually fits well with the official ideology and the moral aspect of official ideology. Um, as mutual helping and, and socialist solidarity and so on and so forth. But the sheer number of people mattered in that context. For example, what if those volunteers went to Sichuan and found out their problems with the school construction and then tell the rest of the world what's going on there? And also what if they find out problems about, you know, the uh, with, with the disaster responses and also the grievances of the local residents. And they tell the rest of the world about what's happening there. That's something that actually the state was really worried about at the moment. And so this is why in only a, a month after the earthquake, uh, the state decided to put heavy restrictions on reporting and stuff like that. So sheer number matters. Um, that's in this Another way to think about is that um, in previous disasters in China in the history of PRC, you didn't see such a convergent, convergence behavior. Uh, for example, the Tangshan earthquake in 1976, mm -hmm. uh, there, is, there was a convergence, but it was a convergence behavior organized by the state. It's strictly organized by the state. It's a political action, top-down political action, instead of just this... Uh, uh, the uh, you know the the emergent behavior from the grassroots society. So uh, if we look at this um, event from a longer historical perspective, it makes more sense to understand this sentence. One of the things that I remember following very closely was the work of the artist Ai Weiwei, yes. who went there and did something which many people might not think was so extraordinary till they learned more about the context, but he went with many others, I think, in village to village as a squad, basically, to collect names. Yes. And then he turned that into a series of artworks that have taken a number of different forms over the years and some uh, backpacks uh, on the sides yeah. of museum buildings, yes. or even just a scroll on YouTube, which was, I think, put up the, on the first anniversary and got him in a lot of trouble um, for doing something that people in, I think, many parts of the world consider like a normal part of a disaster is naming the names of the victims. I think COVID forces us to reflect on Ivy Way's action in a slightly different way. But I wonder what you thought of Ivy Way's work at that time, because you were certainly there while he was doing his work. 
I really was one of the volunteers, I would say. This is actually is the risk of political risk of volunteering, which was the uh, worry of the state that you go there, you find out, you know, there's some problems and you tell the world in one way or another. His way is his artist way, or he's, um, for those of you, the listeners who don't know much about Ai Weiwei, he's a very political artist, or his, you know, arts are just the political, you know, statement or actions. So um, what he did in the wake of the Sichuan earthquake is to recruit volunteers, not just himself, but recruit a large number of uh, volunteers who went to Sichuan, uh, knock on the doors of the primary and uh, uh, middle schools and to ask well, how many students die in your schools and what are their names, where they, where they live and so on and so forth. And I put the number together to show the world that, look, these are the student victims of the earthquake. Um, the numbers are not, the back then the numbers were not released by the state, but we have the numbers and we need to remember them. And the artistic work you uh, works you uh, mentioned, one of them is the backpack one. So the backpack one is, is actually described in my book. So which were thousands of backpacks uh, on the wall of a Munich uh, art museum uh, spelled out the, a sentence by a, a parent to, uh, in a letter to, to uh, Ai Weiwei, which is that she had lived in this world happily for seven years. And she referred to a little girl called Yang Xiaowan. So Ai Weiwei spelled out the, this very simple sentence in the backpacks. Uh, with several intended meanings. One is that even she's a little girl and she deserved the commemoration in a, such a gigantic scale, uh, in a very um, huge and also very um, impressive way to tell the world that even a very, a, every individual's life uh, deserves such commemoration, uh, which also means that you need to remember her name, Yang Xiaowan. Um, so another artistic work is called Nian Nian Buan, we, you also mentioned, so it's more like a, um, the name scrolling on the YouTube. Um, so the name of the artistic work is Nian Nian Buan, which is a Chinese phrase, basically means that you remember someone or some event. But Nian uh, in this phrase has double meanings. One is to read out loud, and the other is to remember. So he asked the volunteers from online to read each of the 5,335 students' name and I'll put together into a super long YouTube uh, video clip, which was simple and also is something that you would imagine that uh, in many other countries people would do, but he got into trouble for that. And he was, uh, but on the other hand, I think is that he's a very internationally renowned artist he has some privileges, and once you become famous, the Chinese government probably will be careful about their crackdown ways. But another local activist I want to emphasize is Tan Zuoren, who is less known outside. He's not internationally famous at all. So he was put into jail in 2009, and after he was released, I interviewed him. So he was the one who actually also suffered much because of his activism. So I guess Ai Weiwei was uh, certainly a very, and also Tan Zuoren, certainly were very extraordinary, but they were two of the volunteers who went to Sichuan. And they actually, their cases actually say something about the political implications of volunteerism, that volunteering and activism are just two things in one in some context. And the conversion between the two is something that the Chinese government was really cautious about. That's such an important point. And I think, and I wonder if you realized it at the time that you were doing this work that Memorial had such a political crackle to it. I mean, that, you yes. know, I think a lot of times in disaster work, people sort of think of memorialization as like this thing that comes after recovery. It's sort of down the road. Mm -hmm. It's after, it's a way people cope. They don't, haven't tended in the United States to think of it as very political. And then, of course, 
Black Lives Matter movement last year, yes. you know, mm -hmm. is in every city and Confederate statues are coming down and Americans mm -hmm. are looking and saying, well, wait a minute, we had some memory deferred here. We have some business to take care of. And suddenly these old statues and these disaster memorials become spaces of political conversation. That's right. Uh, names and number of people who died in an event are always very politically sensitive and important in any country, in any context. So I would say that uh, China case is, and uh, the Sichuan earthquake case is certainly a very extraordinary case, but it's not the only case. As you mentioned that uh, you know, George Floyd's commemoration and the, also the commemoration of the COVID and, and also the number of cases, number of people died and the, the effectiveness of vaccines and so on and so forth. Names and numbers are always politically important. Just want to remind folks you're listening to COVID calls, and I'm talking uh, to sociologist and historian Ben Su today about COVID 19 in China and in commemoration around the world. We've just been talking about his work on the Sichuan earthquake as a sort of background. And let's let's turn now to talk a little bit about COVID. And Ben, I guess I'm sort of curious, first of all, how what you've been watching for through this COVID period in the cultural space around memory and how you sort of bring this background of the China case in Sichuan to bear on what you're seeing. Yeah, a lot of things I can say about this COVID crisis. I'm trying to figure out a good way to, to talk about it. Uh, probably we will take another book um, to write about um, the cultural politics revolving around the COVID crisis, which is a bigger um, book than in my Sichuan book. Sichuan book is basically one person <laughs> with a backpack and going to going to uh, Sichuan and later wrote a dissertation. Now it's more complicated and it's complicated in many, many ways uh, because it's not just a China case, but also a global case. And also any country who's um, severely impacted by this uh, crisis is linked to another country. China and the US are looking at each other. Chinese and Americans are looking at each other in many ways and finger pointing and things like that. Um, there are several things I want to emphasize and probably as preliminary thoughts of my um, observation and also research. Um, one is that the, the change of ways of handling this disaster from Sichuan to COVID in, in China. So Sichuan uh, uh, management is more like a mobilizing. Mobilizing means that uh, everybody follows me and we go to Sichuan. So the state is the leader and the volunteers are, sometimes volunteers are spontaneous, many volunteers following the state and the state created opportunities for volunteers. While in COVID response, that kind of mobilizing certainly existed, but more and more we see the state is playing the um, dominant role. It's a top-down uh, response from the central government to the local government to the street level, not much mobilizing. It's more like a direct control of the society um, to respond to the to the uh, to the disaster. Of course, it has something to do with the features of this disaster, which is an infectious disease. Um, the best way to control infectious disease, probably I'm wrong, but you know, is to lock people at home, not interacting with each other. And this is a perfect disaster for an authoritarian state that they can use the direct top-down control over people. And we see a lot of cases in Wuhan and still now in Guangzhou in, in past several uh, weeks, people are locked in their homes and not allowed to go outside everywhere. You need to have a code and stuff like that. Um, in Wuhan, it's, it's more like an extreme case that you don't, you're not allowed to go outside of your, of your building and people outside are watching you. So this kind of a direct control is kind of different from the Sichuan response, which was a more a case of mobilizing. Another very important difference is that the openness in the wake of the Sichuan earthquake did not actually exist in this time, in this uh, response that you don't see Lots of uh, journalists were able to report 
some politically sensitive issues. And the social media and also the traditional media were severely controlled by the by the by the uh, by the state. Um, this restriction on social media is getting tougher and tougher um, in recent months, as you can tell if you pay attention to what's going on uh, in China. And also some of the, uh, in terms of a commemoration, I think in China, the commemoration didn't really happen. One of the early cases is the uh, Dr. Li Wenliang, who is the whistleblower, who died of this uh, disease after he revealed to the world that there's something going on there. And that was a brief moment of commemoration. People expressed a lot of sorrows and angers toward the Chinese government's cover up in the initial stage. But, you know, all these uh, things were blocked. And also later, because of the relatively effective control of the, uh, of the virus, um, the people actually forgot this case for a while. But I see uh, in the anniversary of Dr. Li Wenliang's death, some of the social media users are not forgetting Dr. Li Wenliang and, and uh, put up uh, uh, posts and pictures online and, and, and stuff like that. Um, but in the United States, I believe that it, it's a chaotic situation in 2020. <laughs> we had an administration uh, which actually started with a denial of the virus and later downplaying the virus. And later everything was politicized from masks um, to vaccine and, and so on and so forth. So it's a very chaotic situation. And in terms of commemoration in the United States, I'm still doing my research. My research assistant and me are working together on coding the cases of a com commemoration and the funerals at a local level. So we have uh, more than 1,600 cases now, I'm trying to categorize them into f private funerals and small public gatherings, or you know, uh, more uh, prominent um, public uh, mourning cases, and so on and so forth. One thing that is very interesting, although it's still preliminary, is that the divide between the public and the private mourning. Hmm. So in the private mourning, for example, family funerals or a small gathering at a local neighborhood and a community level is rarely politicized. People do not talk about political issues, but at a public level, people talk much about uh, political issues, who's responsible for all these deaths and who should be remembered and the class and the race and so on and so forth. But at a local level, People are just saying, well, this person is a good person and the die is unfortunate. Everybody should be cautious and about the virus. And that's basically it. So this actually contradicts one, one of the very classical uh, theoretical statements from Emil Durkheim that is, you know, solidarity. We see solidarity in different ways. The solidarity mm -hmm. at a community level has not been translated into public level. And why it is apolitical in the community level and the very political in the public level. And what, what does that mean for us to understand this uh, disaster? Does that mean that the people do not care about other people's deaths? I still don't know. I, I have no answer to that. Mm. But it's, it's a very interesting case for us to think about. Another way to think about this is from a global perspective is that in previous disasters, um, scholars raised an issue called distant suffering, uh, which meant, for those of you who are unfamiliar with this term, which meant that the people in the West, in the advanced industrial countries, uh, look at disasters in the third world or non-West or Southern uh, countries as a spectation, uh, as a spectacle, uh, more like, um, you know, you're sitting in your living room watching TV, oh, how terrible is that? And uh, you don't think deep and as if the suffering of others is very distant from yours, you don't have to worry too much about it. Uh, the, the best thing you can do is just donate some money and then you forget about it. But this disaster challenges the idea is that the West, East, or the third world, uh, first world, or the South, North division actually is gone. Everybody is suffering. 
It's not just distant suffering. Suffering happens next door in the United States. Everyone knows someone or friends, friends, parents, or or someone in your、uh, immediate network who actually got COVID, who died, and things like that. So, how do you think about this suffering? Is it still distant? I think Americans are not used to that kind of situation. That they think about this kind of thing only happens in the third world country, so called "quote unquote" third world country, and, and it's culturally Americans are not really、um, smart enough to come out a an, an interpretation or a, a better way to think about suffering than happens to fellow Americans. Now it seems that everybody is celebrating this. Sort of a lower cases, and forgetting all these suffering,、uh, and also all the deaths. And if you look at the number, the deaths, the casualty is is really heavy, and it's it's terrible thing. It's and also it's a long process of、uh, deaths and, and suffering. But it seems to me that、um, uh, some mourning rituals should happen,、mm-hmm. do not happen. Uh, for example, at the national level, should we have just you know three day national mourning for the for the、um, COVID、uh, victims? I don't hear that. And and I saw a few、um, mourning rituals sponsored and conducted by non governmental organizations, but that's basically it. And so Americans seem to look forward instead of look backward. And what does that mean,、uh, eventually, or you know, philosophically? Does that、uh, sub- uh, really substantiate a claim that Americans are individualists who care about more more about their individual safety instead of others? I don't know. Maybe it could be a good case for communitarian philosophers to call for more moral conscience、uh, among and, and also mutual. Help and, and a concern with each other's safety and, and compassion on all these issues. Maybe it's a good case for communitarian philosophy.、Uh, well, thank you for going into the detail, the many questions that you're, you're working with right now. And I'm really、um, impressed to hear about the sort of empirical work you're doing, trying to take stock of and understand and document funerals in the United States during this time.、Mm-hmm. And, Um, you know, people who listen to COVID calls know that we've talked with、um, Kristen Urquiza, who's the founder of Marked by COVID, whose father、uh, died, and she、um, used that as a moment to write、uh, what she calls an honest obituary, in、mm-hmm. which she uses the obituary as a form、um, not only of coping with loss but also、um, as political protest. And then、um, Alex Goldstein, who's who does、um, you know the Faces of COVID Twitter feed, which still every day is putting up. Um, shining light on these obituaries,、yes. and he's been keeping a database as well. If you haven't been in touch with Alex, I think you two should be in yeah, contact with great, each other.、Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. I, I, you know, something you said really struck me because I think in a lot of disaster research up until COVID, there was this sort of question that was asked. It's an uncomfortable question a lot of times to say, "Well, if the number of deaths is lower." So let's say you know the 2004 tsunami,、mm-hmm. Indian Ocean tsunami. I mean, the number of deaths is is so high. The suffering is so great, and just as you said, it becomes a sort of spectacle for the West because we're seeing it distantly. We're seeing, and we can't can't imagine that number of deaths. How how could so many people die? What's what's wrong with that?、Mm-hmm. That with the society there? What's wrong with the leadership? What is it a poverty issue? And to to sort of then turn that back on the U.S. and and I've heard people say this. You know, they say, "Well, we just have to look beyond the death count in the United States. You have to look at the imp- impacts of disasters in other ways, but you're not going to see death counts here the way you've seen." I've heard people say that as recently as two years ago.、Um, I think I may have even said this. You know, that we have to really get better about talking about disasters, not just in terms of deaths, because the numbers of deaths in the United States from so-called natural disasters have tended to be lower than in other parts of the world, developing parts of the world. COVID has thrown all that out the window. Yes, and, and we are once again in a space where we are trying to cope with mass ca- a mass casualty disaster, the likes of which we have not seen in the United States since 1918 or the Civil War. Before that, I'm not sure, Ben. We have the cultural tools to grapple with it, and I think I'm just reiterating what you were saying a moment ago about trying to document 
the cultural process that people in the United States are going through right now, it doesn't seem sufficient to me either. Yes, I agree. It's, it's basically, I wouldn't say that um, all Americans are selfish, of course not. And, and also, as you mentioned, many people are doing this, you know, remembering the faces and names of the people. And New York Times once had a front page with all the names uh, of the victims. At the time, the number was 100,000, I believe. Um, so with all the names, which is actually- An unthinkable number at that time. It was, uh, that's why it was so yeah, profound. It's, it's like, who yeah. could have thought that number would have been- That's right. And, and, at, and also in the memorial culture tradition in the United States and in the whole West, names are very important. Names are essential. Uh, in other words, Americans do have this cultural tradition. The difficulty is mainly that the, in, recent, in past several decades, Americans always think about such a terrible thing could only happen to the third world country. It would never happen to us. Hurricane Katrina was a reminder, you know, only several thousands and, and nothing basically compared. Many Americans compared to like Indian Ocean tsunami or you know, other, you know, Tangsha earthquake and then Sichuan earthquake and things like that. Um, and then they would say like, well, this is the most terrible disaster. And now you have this, um, you know, COVID and the number is the, the one of the biggest thing in the world. And, and, and people do not know how to remember the victims and how, how to use the uh, cultural resources to talk about their suffering and their death and, and their family's loss, except for all this so terrible, I feel sympathetic and the stuff like that. And, and should we politicize everything or should we talk about some of the issues and who should be responsible for the deaths. And also COVID is a very special disaster. It's, it's a long process. So you have this incremental deaths over a year. And usually after disaster uh, is over, you know, you have the moment that disaster is over and then you commemorate the victims. But for a, a pandemic that lasted more than a year and still ongoing to some extent and everybody you have several hundred people died in the united states and then you're not sure when we should have a commemoration date and it's not in the memorial culture in, the, in tradition so it's a very practical issue and also what kind of a memorial in in physical sense should look like after the whole thing is done and should we go uh, with the uh, Vietnam Veterans Memorial pattern, only mentioning the names, put names on the wall without mentioning the disaster at all, uh, pretending the event is just an event and the victims are just unfortunate, not talking about event, just talking about individuals, or should we put some statement about the wrongs that many people did uh, particularly the authorities and the government and so on and so forth. And also it's it's even we go with the second option, we talk about the political issues and the social issues revolving around this disaster. We are not sure about the division, uh, the divide between the individuals and the government. In other words, mm. uh, what 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 do you think about those American individuals who are still going to bars at the at the very terrible days of the pandemic? Are they responsible for other people's deaths? So I read read some of the statements in private funerals. A few of them are surprisingly political and and the political in a way that they urge Americans to stay home, not to go to bars and restaurants. That was pretty much last year, uh, November, October, at the time when the cases were many. Um, so it was a very sort of a distressing uh, situation that people are urging each other not to behave so badly, but many people didn't actually listen. And also the uh, common practices like wearing masks, keeping social distancing were so politicized that even some politicians advocate for some, you know, um, conspiracy theory or disinformation and stuff like that. All these things are very different in this disaster, which I never seen in other disasters, at least not to that scale. 
Just a reminder, you're listening to COVID Calls. I'm talking today to Bin Su about memorial culture around the world and COVID-19. Um, I wanted to sort of bring it back to the global context for a second, Ben. I'm sort of curious how you think different cultures are watching each other in this time. Mm-hmm. And so I'm thinking about, you know, and of course it's not, it's it's hard to generalize. There's not a Chinese gaze of the West any more than there's an American gaze of China. We can talk about what leaders say. So this kind of work is very hard. I mean, always yeah. cultural analysis is so, you think you've got it and it slips through your fingers. Having said that, I am curious about sort of Chinese memorial culture around COVID at this time, if to the extent that there is one that you can put your finger on. And I'm also interested in how, what kind of discourses are available in China to make sense of what's happening in America? Because okay. there's always with disaster, this sense of the idea of sort of like what's happening to us, but also what's happening to other people and how, how do we learn from that as to how we should take care of our own? I think that's an important part that's often overlooked. Yeah, it's a hard question. It may take serious research instead of just talking here because it's a very complicated issue. Uh, from because I'm not able to talk to anyone in this, you know, uh, in, in face-to-face way, which I think is still well. It sounds very traditional and old, but I believe it's still very effective way, uh, more effective than online chats and stuff like that. Uh, to get people to talk about in an honest way. But because of the pandemic, I'm not able to do that. So what I observed is basically the impression from uh, the media, and traditional media and the social media in China. Uh, I would have to say that we are living in an age of disinformation. <laughs> Unfortunately, the disinformation in China was actually propagated by the Chinese government in an intentional way. So the, according to my reading of the social media and, and, and the traditional media, people in China now are looking at the United States as a failed case, which for good reasons, you know, uh, that they, we also think in that way as well. Um, but one of the political issues about this kind of a perception is that the state actually intentionally manufactured uh, this kind of discourse to say, look, they're really bad and we are superior to the United States. Therefore, their claim of democracy, their claim of technology and the science is just the fraud. It's, it, it's basically just nonsense and we are better. Uh, so that is the impression I got from the media. Of course, you will say that this is not true. And for things like vaccines in the very beginning, that the Chinese media is basically that our vaccines are better and the inactive vaccine with traditional safer and stuff like that until November that uh, Pfizer and uh, Moderna announced their success. And then you see a mass smear campaign launched by the state media on Pfizer and Moderna, uh, amplifying their side effects and focusing on, on, you know, several cases of deaths and stuff like that. And basically it's to say like, you know, their vaccines are dangerous, don't take it, and, and so on and so forth. Our vaccines are better. But at the time, the Chinese citizens don't think they have the need to do to do vaccination because, you know, basically zero cases in, in China. Um, um, so that was one of the uh, one of the issues that in the social media. I want to say that it's it's less a cultural perception or cultural difference than political. Now, uh, I think in this globalized world, talking about cultural difference is a bit too uh, naive, that the cultural differences are always like a politicized. And also sometimes it is used as a pretext for some political uh, actions. Um, so this is what I got here uh, from my very preliminary observation of the of the media and also i think in the same thing happened in the united states everything about china particularly on the trump administration that everything about china should be blamed for this disaster and trump used racist and even some nasty words to describe uh china um putting chinese government chinese people and the uh, the country of china together in the same basket so that was the trick right 
So if you blame Chinese government and apparently you should do something or say something about Chinese American here, about Chinese in China and so on and so forth. So that everything was in a chaotic situation. And then we see the rise of anti-Asian and anti-Chinese racism in the United States. So that was the very bad consequences of this kind of uh, perception, which is also very politicized. I, I really appreciate the, this discussion in that sense that um, that I think you're right, that the, it, some idea that we can flatten out a concept of what culture means at this time, it really mm -hmm. is not that helpful anymore. But mm -hmm. it, it then puts enormous emphasis on the researchers to collect the many different discourses that are in play at any given time. Mm -hmm. And as you said, and I couldn't agree with this more, I think what's really profound in this disaster as opposed to previous ones I've studied, is the role of disinformation and conspiracy thinking as quite central to the entire experience, no longer peripheral, but actually right at the center of understanding even governmental actions in the United States and in China both. That's one thing that they share, I think, in this regard. But that work is very hard work. Even in a, in a free society where researchers have freedom of, of movement and they have freedom um, of communication, it's not easy. So what's to the extent that you know, how are people doing this kind of work within within China right now? Trying to, again, I'm sort of thinking of your Sichuan work, documenting what's happened, collecting the names of those who've, who've died, trying to understand the way funerals are working. Because that's sort of that, at that street level, at that ground level, that's just really important work to make sense of what this disaster means. Yeah, I think um, doing this kind of research is very difficult in China, as you can imagine. That um, so, I guess researchers choose to focus on safe political safe aspect of the disaster. Let's say how uh, people in the neighborhood are mobilized by the state to help the disaster relief effort. That's a very safe topic, and actually, I saw a few articles on that uh, about the COVID. <laughs> but as for disinformation. As for the deaths of children, um, you know, uh, in their own schools, I don't see a lot of serious research. Uh, my uh, my work probably uh, is one of the few uh, studies, even the English language uh, is one of the few studies about uh, these political aspects. Uh, many people warn me that you probably will get into trouble, <laughs> political trouble for your work. I guess that's a very fair warning and then also reasonable. <laughs> Uh, reasonable expectation. Um, so I was contacted by my friends who are publishers in China. Um, they they know that I wrote a book. Can can we just translate your book into Chinese? I was like, no, that's not possible for you. <laughs> You're getting into trouble. I'll get into trouble too. So uh, we are living in a world, um, although it's globalized, but globalization is never so romantic, never so smooth. Uh, globalization means conflicts, means troubles and dilemmas. Um, every individual in this globalized world is facing a lot of dilemmas, political, cultural, and social dilemmas. Uh, so global, being global doesn't always mean that being frequent flyers, um, uh, visiting different countries, and living in great hotels, and we're living in troubles, in suffering, uh, in all these pains, and we have to deal with it because that's the trend. Almost up on time. In my discussion with Ben Su today, but I just want to underline something you said. If I understand you right, we have the benefit of your insights and learning here. We can read your Sichuan book. You're telling me that um, that's not possible in China. People are not reading, are not able to read that work there. That's not possible to read that kind of that kind of work. Of course, PDFs are circulating among some people, but you know, it it you never got got published for that kind of work. So, just as we're finishing up here, you've been describing some of these uh, some of the research that you have ongoing. I wonder, you know, thinking out maybe a year from now, or so, or maybe further than that. This is. These are the topics that are going to be capturing your interest for the foreseeable future. This is the COVID work is where you're where you're situated right now. Yeah, I'm currently doing a few interrelated topics. One is the COVID morning I just mentioned. Um, first, I want to focus on the United States and then probably expand to other countries who are heavily affected 
And the second is to extend my previous work about states' cultural responses to disaster, uh, looking at COVID, and particularly comparison between uh, China and the US, uh, which actually speaks to one of the highly debated uh, topics that is about whether authoritarian state uh, has superiority in terms of responding to disaster than a democratic state, which I think is a wrong question because um, we sh first need to define response. That response not only means that how quick you get to disaster side or how many cases you can control, but also means that uh, how a state uh, addresses the suffering and the sorrow of the, uh, and also the death of the people. In other words, cultural meanings of death and the suffering matters for a, a state's legitimacy and, and all kinds of cultural authorities. So that was one of the, another related topic, a little bit far, but not so far, is to look at the uh, transnational debates in the Chinese speaking public sphere over Black, Black Lives Matter uh, movement. So this was the first time in history that the Chinese in China are so interested in the race-based movement in another country. Uh, you probably would never think of this, this kind of situation. Many people in China are very, very interested and have, have lots of opinions about Black Lives Matter. Some of the opinions are pretty racist by American standard, but I try to find out why they're so interested in the in a movement in another country which has no direct relationship with China and what kind of uh, things they want to say or uh, how does this debate tell us about their minds and, and their their thoughts about various issues such as race, such as democracy and so on. You've been listening to COVID Calls and you can catch COVID Calls every weekday 5.30 p.m. Eastern time. Tomorrow, please join me at 5.30 when I talk with Disaster researcher Carly Purdom will be talking about COVID-19 and incarcerated populations, and she'll be talking about new research that she's been doing, so please do join me for that. And I want to thank my guest today, I did, had been looking so forward to this conversation and learning from you, Bin Su. Thank you for the work you do. Thanks for sharing thank some of your thoughts right now. We'll be watching for your publications uh, coming out of this time. It's going to be really important work. Thanks again. Thank you very much. Stay healthy, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow at 530.